This is chapter five of my book, 1970s America, and the title of the chapter is "Brush with Greatness." My first brush with greatness at University of Florida was with Jimmy Carter, who became the American president in 1976. One day in later part of January 1975. I was coming back in the evening to my office from BT Towers when I saw posters all over the campus announcing that Jimmy Carter, the Democratic presidential candidate, will speak at 8 p.m. in the McCarthy Auditorium. <clears throat> I normally used to go to my dorm around 5 or 5:30 p.m. to cook, and after dinner, would usually come back to my office in the department to study or to do experiments in the lab. till about 12 or 12:30 a.m. the quiet atmosphere of the office at that night was excellent to study hence when i saw those posters in the evening i thought it might be worthwhile to go and see what a potential president of united states is all about coming from a political family i was curious about politics in united states and the talk by jimmy carter provided an excellent opportunity to find out more thus i went a little early in the auditorium and sat in an aisle seat next to near the back so that if i got bored i could leave the talk without disturbing other people at exactly 8 pm jimmy carter entered the auditorium from the back smiling his toothy smile and shaking hands with the audience as he passed by he shook hands with me and casually asked where i was from to which i replied india and he moved on His thick southern accent was difficult to follow, but his smiling face and charming and gracious manners captivated me, and so I sat through throughout his speech. After the lecture came the question-answer time. A black woman got up and literally lit up into Jimmy Carter, accusing him of racism since he came from South and calling him names, etc. Throughout this question, Jimmy Carter simply kept on smiling. and answered the question without any rancor or irritation he never appeared to be perturbed or rattled at all i was extremely impressed by his demeanor and behavior so i came back to my office around 9:30 pm and told my office mates that i just saw the next president of united states one of my office mates got livid and told me that i had been in us only for a month and how dare could i pass a judgment on the political candidates The next president will be Ronald Reagan he told me I had no idea who Reagan was but somehow my gut feeling told me that Jimmy Carter may become the next president I became so interested in his campaign that I used to read everything on him that came in the newspapers so I used to go to the main library on UF campus and read editorials in New York Times Washington Post Miami Herald etc and became quite knowledgeable about Jimmy Carter and his policies i was delighted when he became the president and i still feel that he was the most decent president that us had in the last 50 60 years i used to debate with my american friends and office mates regarding the pros and cons of carter candidacy and they were amazed at my knowledge that is when i felt that americans had become quite illiterate since they hardly read the papers and form their opinion only from news bites on television my crowning glory came when i persuaded successfully my office mate to vote for jimmy carter in 1976 presidential election another great man i met at uf was wonder von braun he was the father of us space program and a genius rocket expert who designed and developed the v2 rocket for Nazi Germany and later on came to US after the second world war he set up the tone for NASA and was its deputy administrator and chief designer of rockets dr von braun and my professor dr erik farber were good friends both were of german origin and since farber also played an important role in the design of saturn v rocket they knew each other quite well on 15 july 1975 the first us ussr space docking took place it was a great great achievement in terms of the peaceful space cooperation 
between two superpowers. Dr. Von Braun came to UF to meet Dr. Farber so that both of them could go and see the launch of the U.S. spacecraft from Kennedy Space Center near Cape Canaveral. Naturally, they were VIPs, so saw the launch from close range. I also went to see the launch later that day, but saw it from 15 miles away. Thus, Dr. Farber introduced me to his star as a star student to Dr. Von Braun. I could only chat with him for 5 to 10 minutes since both of them were in a hurry to go to Kennedy Space Center. He seemed a very nice and simple man and we had a very pleasant conversation. He told me that I was very fortunate to study with a world-renowned solar energy expert. Stanley Ulam was another great name at University of Florida. He was a distinguished professor, professor of mathematics at UF and was an extremely humble person. He kept a low profile and very few students knew that such a great figure was at UF. He was the true father of the hydrogen bomb. This title was usurped by Dr. Edward Teller, who was quite an obnoxious person and took most of the credit himself. But it was Dr. Ulam's paper in early 1950s which clearly showed the possibility of a hydrogen bomb and how it could be built. Later on, I heard Dr. Teller at UF and in his lecture, he appeared very arrogant and pompous. After the talk, Dr. Teller had a long meeting with Dr. Farber on solar energy and next day Farber told me how Teller tried to show that he knew much more than him. I forgot exactly how I came to know Dr. Ulam, Ulam but he enjoyed Indian philosophy and we did discuss a couple of times some issues in Indian philosophy. Dr. Ulam was one of the few persons in whose presence I felt extremely humble and had a feeling of well-being used to give excellent seminars and loved to tell wonderful stories of his interactions with brilliant scientists both at MIT where he was a professor and at Las Almos where he was one of the key scientists in the atom bomb Manhattan project. Another great mathematician at UF was Vas Vasil M. Popov. He was very soft spoken and a thorough gentleman. He had a stability criteria named after him. I took an advanced mathematics course under him called Stability Theory. It was a very deep course and I was the only mechanical engineering student in it. All others were students and faculty from mathematics department. I was extremely interested in mathematics and it was my favorite subject. Dr. Popov's course was a logical step after a good number of courses in mathematics that I took I had taken at University of Florida. Dr. Farber once told me that if I took one more mathematics course, then I would have to shift to mathematics department from mechanical engineering. Dr. Popov had just joined UF as a distinguished professor in 1975, and this was the first time he was teaching this course at UF. I had difficulty in understanding the deep mathematics and so worked very hard on his lectures and used to go to the library to read extra material. Near the middle of quarter, we inquired from Dr. Popov when the midterm examination would be held, at which he quietly told us that there will be no examination in this course and the fact that we were attending it regularly was enough proof that we were interested in knowledge. So all of us got an A grade. There were other well-known names at UF during my time. For example, Professor K. Polhausen, a distinguished professor in Engineering Sciences Department was one of the pioneers of fluid mechanics with L. Prandtl and H. von Karno. He was an extremely old man and I saw him a number of times standing on the bus stand to catch the bus. A person like that in India would have been a national hero chauffeured in a car, yet in US he was another professor with no special treatment. This fact had a tremendous impression on my young mind. Some of my friends who were in engineering sciences department used to speak often about him. Two other great names with whom I interacted briefly were Peter Laudin and Howard T. Odom. Peter Laudin was a distinguished research professor in chemistry department. He was a theoretician and a well-known figure in quantum chemistry. I came to know about him from my Indian roommate who was doing his PhD in quantum chemistry and Laudin was one of his committee members. Peter Laudin had joined appointments at University of Uppsala in Sweden and University of Florida. 
so he used to spend winters in Florida and summers in Sweden. In fact, there were quite a number of big names in academia who came to UF because of the weather. They had done their major work in other well-known universities and when nearing retirement, they would take an appointment and sometimes joint appointment at UF. Peter Lovedeen was also a member of the Nobel Prize Committee. I once invited him for the multidisciplinary seminars on energy that I used to hold in the mechanical engineering department during 1978-79. I was still a graduate student at that time. These university-wide seminars had become quite well known and popular and there were a couple of stories written on them in the local newspapers. Thus quite a number of UF faculty used to look forward to an invitation to talk in these seminars. I think it was a remarkable event that a graduate student was allowed to run these seminars and the department gave all the help. Such a thing would be unheard of in, in Indian university campuses. After the seminar series ended in spring 1979, the chairman of mechanical engineering department gave a glowing recommendation letter to me stating that I as a graduate student could do what his faculty could not accomplish. These seminars were the outcome of my conviction that nature knows best and that we should learn from it and copy it. This is now known as biomimicry, but in those times this field was not so well explored. Thus I used to invite professors and faculty members from different disciplines including engineering, agriculture, entomology, medicine, physics, chemistry, etc. to talk on energy. The seminars were held every Thursday in Mechanical Engineering Auditorium and the series was spread over three quarters. I had invited Peter Lovedeen to talk on the second law of thermodynamics, an energy problem. Before the seminar, I would go to the concerned faculty member and discuss what he or she should talk on. I would request all of them to talk on how they saw a solution of the energy crisis through their work. Since this was a popular seminar series and also due to the stature of Peter Lovedeen, the Mechanical Engineering Auditorium which seated 250 people was jam-packed. Out of allotted 50 minutes, Dr. Lovedeen spoke for 45 minutes on an obscure theorem that he was working on in non-equilibrium thermodynamics in the last 5 minutes on the second law and energy. By the time he finished, there were only a handful of persons left in the audience. It was one of the most boring seminars in the series. Thus, a well-known name does not guarantee that he or she would also be a good speaker. In fact, I have found quite a number of times that some very well-known researchers are extremely poor teachers and speakers. H.T. Odom, on the other hand, was a different fair. He was a good teacher and gave interesting and lucid talks. Dr. Odom was also a distinguished professor in environmental engineering and a pioneer in using systems theory in ecology. I had won many, he had won many international awards and had set up a well-known center for wetlands at UF. He was a tall and bulky with a very prominent nose but extremely soft-spoken. I invited Dr. Odom to give a talk in the energy seminar series. <clears throat> Dr. Odom gave a couple of talks on energy systems and public policy and the last talk he gave before I left UF for India was on the energy of soul. A lot of people thought that he had gone wonky but I thought that he had guts and the courage to talk on a subject that he felt was interesting. To my mind the whole basis of scholarship is to conduct research on and talk on subjects which one finds interesting and in those times US educational environment encouraged such ideas. A regular visitor to UF campus was Dr. Manfred Eigen, a Nobel laureate in chemistry and the director of Max Planck Institute in Germany. He used to come yearly to UF and gave a series of lectures on evolution and the second law of thermodynamics. I attended these lectures which normally had 15 to 20 persons in the audience. Dr. Eigen was a great speaker, taught a very difficult subject with a great ease and made it understandable. He was a handsome man and was always accompanied by very attractive female assistants, which was an added attraction to attend his lectures. Besides these, there was, a, there was a regular flow of outstanding educators, academicians and well-known figures whose lectures I attended on all different subjects, ranging from out-of-body experiences to particle physics 
to cosmology. This aspect of UF campus life I have always missed after coming back to India. Every good university in US has a large number of such intellectual interactions. It is up to the students to partake of and learn from them. I often found that very few students that I knew had the breadth of interest to take advantage of the rich intellectual life that UF offered.